hosting our event. Um, some of our uh, speakers are running late, so we're going to go ahead, inshallah, uh, we're going to follow our uh, program that we had, I mean, actually the order, but we'll, inshallah, bring them in as they come in. Supposedly there's a backup on 495, uh, so inshallah they'll be, they'll be here soon, inshallah. But we do have some of our speakers here already. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start uh, with the recitation of Holy Quran. I would like to invite Sheikh Adam, inshallah. Shaytan al-Rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Malik Yawm al-Din Iyaka na'abud wa Iyaka nasta'in إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Uh, most of you know uh, the incident that took place about a week ago here in our backyard. Um, a kid from uh, Muslim youth from, uh, I believe it was Osborne Park High School, who was uh, arrested by the FBI uh, on the suspicion of helping someone get to Syria to join ISIS. Um, of course, you do realize until someone receives, receives a due process, uh, they're not considered guilty. Uh, so, inshallah, uh, we have enough confidence uh, in our judicial system in our country where we should receive a fair, fair trial. Assuming that these allegations are true, uh, this is a very troubling uh, scenario for us here, the Muslims living here in this country. If a organization like ISIS is able to recruit our children in our backyard, that is a huge concern for all of us living here in this country, uh, in this community, in Prince William County. Not only that, and throughout Virginia. Uh, that is the reason why we are joining forces with other Muslim organizations and other massages to tackle this issue. And today is the uh, first series of events that we're, inshallah, we'll be planning uh, to tackle this issue. We have arranged for uh, very good speakers who are going to address this issue from the uh, from Islamic perspective, because ISIS does use uh, quotes from Quran, uh, legitimizing what they're doing. Uh, we're going to have our, uh, you know, very informed, very educated, uh, scholars who are going to come in and let us know exactly where Islam stay, uh, stands when it comes to terrorism. Uh, then we have uh, our very well-renowned, uh, uh, you know, civic leaders as well, who will also tell us from the, the civic perspective and the government perspective as to where do we our community stands and how should we tackle this issue, inshallah? Uh, so first, I would like to introduce uh, our neighbor, Imam, uh, from Manassas Mosque, Imam Nahidian, to come in and say a few words, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, we can come together and discuss about some of the issues pertaining our community and our own man. You all know that the concept of uh, Daesh, I mean, I don't know if you want to call it ISIS, ISIL, whatever that they call it, 
it was established with the name of Shi'i Sunni at the beginning. Now, it is no longer that issue, but rather it is a group of people, a terrorist, and instead of ISIS, Islamic, which usually when the uh, media calls it Islamic State, and I call them, I said, why do you call it Islamic State? He says, that's what they call themselves. I said, what if I call a WTO group up there? What do you want to do like that? He says, no, we'll sue you. Now, you see, the idea is that I has to be changed to T, terrorist state. That is not Islamic State. Holy Quran, as beautiful as it is, it starts with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Adam, our Indian brother, Muhammad uh, al-Shaykh, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. With the name of Allah, that His Rahmah is all over the humanity. His blessing is whether it is you are a Kafir or you are a Muslim or you are a Muslim, it is the same beautiful heaven is going to cover you. The same rain is going to pour all over you. The same food is going to be given to all of you. Yet His Rahim, if you recognize Him for the life of hereafter, Today, our responsibility is nothing but be with each other, work with each other. As our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَلَهَا حُرْمَةَ هَلْهُولَا وَلَسَوَبَ اللَّهُ Your respect is must be to me. As I look at you, each and every one of you, you are the creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From head to toes, you belong to Him. Every particle of your body says, heaven, 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 heaven. Why? If heaven wasn't moving, you wouldn't be in this earth. If the perfection of heaven wasn't there, we wouldn't be in this earth the way that you are. Who are you? The creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what should I do with you? 100% respect in all aspects of my life with you. Then the life of hereafter, then it becomes the issues of heaven and hell. And I have neither the key for neither one of them. Neither one of you have We will go ahead and, since I have a very short time to talk to you, allow me to tell you, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he moved to the city of Mecca, he knew for 23 years, what did they do to him for 13 years in the city of Mecca? They bothered him, they beat him, they sent him to exile, they did whatever that they could do to him. Finally, he had to run away from Mecca to Medina. After eight years, after of course, 13 years that he of course had to leave, and uh, after the 21st year or the eight years of the Hijrah, he comes back to the city of Mecca. He knew that Abu Sufyan and all of those people, they were against him. What did he do to them? Did he say, now that I'm here, all of you mushriks, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to do this and that and that? The history says, when they entered into the city of Mecca, the flag was in the hand of one of the Sahaba, who called al Yom Yom Al-Malhama, today is a day of bloodshed. He said, immediately go get it from him. And he changed it. He says, take the flag to the hand of this one and say, al yawm yawm marhama Today is a day of blessing, not malhama, bloodshed. And then he spoke, you know that history. He says, people of Mecca, you are three kind of people. The first one, those that you are against me, go with Abu Sufyan's house. Those that you are indifferent, go to your houses. Those that you are with me, go around the camp, I want to talk to you. This is how his attitude was. Rahmatan lil alameen, a blessing to the whole universe. What part of the Rasulullah and his sunnah is telling us to be beside that? What part of the Holy Quran is telling us to do what Daesh is doing, ISIS is doing? Where does it exist? Nowhere in the humanity at all. Human is made free. That is why the ayat of the Quran is talking about the Christians, the Jews, the Sahabi, all of the people that they have varieties of the religion, you are under Islam. When Rasulullah went, you probably have gone to the, some of you that you have gone to Medina, you know that the treaty that he made with the, all the Jews around the city of Medina, he made the treaty. The first constitution that was established actually in the humanity, this is by Rasulullah You are all in peace and harmony as long as you don't raise your weapons against us. You don't raise your swords. This is where Islam is. But what do they want to do? Let me give you my, ex my uh, way of thinking, of course, unfortunately. I'm not going to tell it to this organization or any organization. The same way that they established Zionism in the heart of the Judaism, with the same idea they established ISIS for the Muslims. As you probably know, we were actually 
sometimes uh, at the demonstration that was here when this guy was uh, in, in Washington. Uh, you know, in APAC, they were Jews that they were there, not in our names. You know, those are the, actually the true Jews as we call them, of course, they came from the New Jersey, uh, Hasidic Jews. And they said, not in our name. Israel is not Judaism. Zionist is not Judaism. We as a Muslim say, ISIS is not Islam at all. With the same idea that they created Zionism within the system of so-called Judaism, with the same idea ISIS is created with the name of Islam among the Muslims. Accept it. That neither Zionism is a part of Judaism, nor ISIS is a part of Islam. Accept it. That those that they want to do these things, they are connected. You know, many, many of our scholars that they are here, they know it. That this concept was developed actually and created by anti-Islam movement by the Zionism and international arrogance. And if I want to get to that one, if you want to get to that one, gladly you know who I am. I will be glad to give you varieties of the books later on to study and to see ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. It is made to create dissensions among the Muslims, among the brothers and sisters, to make the brothers against the sisters, sisters against the sisters, so divide and rule will become a reality. And we and you, brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, that you have been given the Holy Quran. And I give you this hadith and I stop. Is it Tabasid Alaikum al Patan? Kirat al Layl al Mughlaf Alaikum al Quran. When you see the darkness is coming through your problems, the problems in your society, and you know there is a solution to it, what can I do? What can I do? Go back to Quran. We have one Quran that it is more than 99.999% common between us. Then why do we stick to something that it is a little bit within that little bit of differences? May Allah protect us all and bless us all and to be what He wants us to do rather than what we want to be. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you very much. Um, we have a lot of speakers, so inshallah we'll try to adhere to our time limits. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our youth coordinator, uh, Brother uh, Muhammad Hussein. Uh, we've hired him uh, for the purpose of activities for our youth, and alhamdulillah, he's been a, a blessing. Um, he, our participation uh, in our youth program has increased considerably. And alhamdulillah, inshallah, we'll continue to provide uh, additional services to help uh, and guide our youth.
tested us with two different things. He's tested us with shahwat and he's tested us with shubhat. He's tested us with desires and he's tested us with doubts. And there is extremists in both scenarios. You have people that, and we all, we all struggle with this. We all struggle with our desires. And people are tested to different extents, and people, some people are stronger than others, and some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allows them to be saved from their own desires. But you can still be an extremist in your desires. But usually, more likely than not, your desires and the problems created by your desires will only affect you, number one. And number two is, Usually when you do something and you're following a desire, usually you know you're in the wrong. You understand that you're in the wrong and you know that you have, you have to make, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and seek tawbah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we have the other type of extremism. Extremism in your doubts, in your shubuhat. And when you're extreme in your shubuhat, when you're extreme in your doubts about the religion, more likely than not, you think you're right, you think you're correct. And the problems that ensue from your extremism and your doubts create problems for all of the people around you. Create problems for your friends, create problems for your classmates, for your co-workers, for your neighbors. If you're even associated with a person who gets in trouble or does something because of a doubt they had about their religion, everyone ends up getting a knock on their door. So we don't, we don't condone any type of extremism. We don't condone extremism as Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from both desires and our doubts. And usually what I found in my years around many different youth, many different youth who have come back to the religion, have come from one extreme, from the extreme of being indul so indulged in their desires and in the world and you know not praying, not coming to the masjid, some of them even borderline leaving Islam, come back to religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them. But then a lot of times because they feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided them, they feel like they have to make up for everything that they did before, all of their sins from before, from the past. So this leads them to jump from one extreme to the other extreme. They feel they have to do something so great, almost like a penance for everything that they did before. And I've seen this in my experience with the youth. I've seen this happen time and time again. And in many scenarios, many situations, those who are extreme in their desires are often neglected by different massages in different communities. You have uh, a, young, a young kid walking into a masjid and you know, the person doesn't look like they're, you know, they're really practicing Islam or they're doing something which is not symbolic of Islam or a sister comes to the masjid and she doesn't look like she's practicing Islam or, you know, she's not wearing a hijab or something like this. Everybody has their struggles. And then these people are shunned. These people, because they're struggling with their, some kind of desire or some kind of, some, something that they're having a hard time with, they're shunned by the community. And everybody gives them this look instead of coming to the person and sincerely advising them or talking to them in a, in a nice, kind manner, they are shunned. At the same time, when we have those who are extreme in their doubts, who you know may have some kind of extreme, a crazy ideology, everybody kind of backs away from this person and says, you know, if, if I talk to this person, maybe, maybe somebody will see me, maybe somebody's recording me and I, and I get myself in trouble as well. And usually these two people end up leaving the masajid and the communities and then they cause trouble, the, the trouble that they cause, the problems that they cause come back and affect all the members of the community. Which is why it's upon each and every one of us to take steps to address these issues and these problems before they begin. And that goes back to just education, simple education. You have some people, subhanAllah, you know, they may not they may not pray, they may not pay their zakat, they may not fast, they may not do anything. But 
when they were younger, their parents took them to a Sunday school or a weekend school, and they, they gained some kind of understanding about their religion, and they may be like in a bar or in a club somewhere, and, and they're talking about extremists such as ISIS and other groups, and they're like, these people are crazy, this is not Islam. Right, and they're, and then a, a lot of times, you know, somebody will look at them and say, who, who are you to say, uh, who are you to say something about these people? Are you practicing Islam yourself? But this person has, was given this, this correct upbringing. They were brought into the communities. They were taught from a young age Islam and what, it, what, what Islam is and how وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا That Islam is a balanced religion. And then you have the other people who have doubts in their religion and they look down upon the people who are struggling with their desires. So it's extremely important that we address these issues and that we educate our youth from a young age and we grow with our youth in the masajid. As our youth grow, we grow with them. A lot of our youth, they leave the masajid and they end up uh, studying YouTube Islam right, and Google Islam because their community and their leaders are not growing with them. Your imam or your leader, your youth director can no longer understand your problems, can no longer understand your issues. And what happens when you get stuck in YouTube Islam and internet Islam is you listen to everybody. You listen to somebody because they have, you know, 100,000 followers on Twitter. Or this person has a lot of likes. Or this person, you know, everybody's talking about them. They're, they're what's hot. So everybody wants to listen to them. And you have no idea who this person is. And we get detached from the leaders in our community. And we have a question, we have an issue in our life, we have a problem, and instead of asking, coming to the, the masjid closest to us, maybe we live two miles from the masjid, instead of coming to the masjid and asking the imam, or asking the leaders in the community, we go and we try and find our answers online. And you have no idea who's answering your question, you don't know anything about this person. And this, this is something that, this is one of the gateways to extremism. This is one of the gateways to extremism, so it's, it's extremely important, especially for our youth, to try and like, speak with their leaders, speak with the, their, community, the, their community leaders, their imams, about the issues that they're having. And if they want to listen to certain things online, if they, if they enjoy listening to somebody, just ask your imam, hey, what do you think about this person? Should I be listening to this person? Is this what this person is saying uh, co correct? Can I, can I learn from this person? Can I study with this person? Because with, with the internet and the information age, it's extremely difficult to find out who poisoned this young person because there's so much information out there before it was easy you know before the internet you know that if, if, if somebody has some kind of ideology you know it's probably from their community or from their message but now the internet's out there and we learn so much from from the internet and from being online that we do not spend time in our communities and it's, it's hard for us to address the issue it's hard for us to respond to an issue because what do you tell a person don't use the internet don't go on the internet, don't use Facebook, don't use Twitter. What do you tell the person? So it's extremely important that we connect with our community leaders and speak with our community leaders. And it's important that our community leaders grow with our youth. Grow with our youth and grow with everything that's going on around us. And I think my time is up. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all of us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us. Uh, as the balanced ummah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our communities, to protect our society, to protect our youth. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us Jannah. Wallahu a'ala wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I'm not as tall as brother Hussain, so I have to um, Next, I would like to introduce our speaker, Muslims, as for African Americans, when they run into issues, when they think they're being discriminated against, uh, they have NAACP to turn to. For Muslims, we, we look to care uh, to put, protect our rights when we think we need representation. Uh, so care has been serving our community for many years. Uh, the executive director of CARE, Professor Nikhan Dawad, is here with us uh, to share uh, some pointers uh, with our youth. Professor Nikhan, I'd like to welcome you.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. This is not a fundraising. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وله. I just received a text message from my son that he won the race. Then the race in Virginia among 200 people. So I'm so happy for him. And uh, by the way, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my son. Uh, at the age of 15, um, he became the youngest uh, certified naturalist in the history of the state of Virginia. You know what it means? It means that we have young people like him who care about the environment in this country. They know so much about forest tree, about trees, about animal life, wildlife, and how to preserve it and what to do about it. So I'm very, very proud of my son, and I would say invite him here to give you some seminars on many of these good things. He's now studying at Virginia Tech. Um, and he's also the second Eagle Scout in, uh, at Athens. And the first Eagle Scout was my oldest son. Uh, so we have monopoly over by scouting at Adams Center. Um, the reason I wanted to start with this is to uh, tell you that our young people are good people. They're busy in doing something good for our community and for our society. Um, and today we are here to talk about uh, one incident that took place here. And I really would like to put things in context for you so that we don't have the extremes of the total denial that, oh, we do not have a problem, or the other extreme that say, oh, let's panic, you know, this is all over the place, and, you know, we should just run, run away. Uh, both extremes are rejected. But before that, let me tell you about, on the national level, what we're doing. Our organizations need some maintenance. The community on the national level needs some, some unity some unification, some coordination among ourselves. MashaAllah, we have some high-profile, successful local and national organizations, but all together, I don't feel that our community is united or it's doing its job together. So for the past three and a half years, we have been discussing among national leaders and representatives of the grassroots main organizations like, like ICNA, MASS, uh, CARE, uh, and W.D. Muhammad, uh, the African American brothers and sisters who have historic organizations in the society. We have been doing business just by ourselves. No coordination on any major or domestic issue, and that was a failure of leadership. And that speaks to how young people look up to national leaders and organizations. So, about seven months ago, we announced the formation of a, an important historic organization. It is called the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations. And I would like you to know about it. And I would like you to take a role into the formation and even activities of this. And let me just spend one minute and you will ask question, how does this relate to what we were talking about? It relates very much and I will show you. The U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations is probably one of the first historic attempts by diverse national leaders to come together and decide that we need to coordinate our work. So with the formation of this, we have a vision to help unify the Muslim community, to create almost at the end of the road the Congress of Muslim Organizations in the United States so that we count in number, we count in our contribution, but also we know who we are as a Muslim community. So one of the, the signature projects that we're planning to do is to do census of the Muslim community. Who are the Muslims? Where do they live? What's their level of education? What's their economic potential? How do they feel about issues? There is no such attempt to do that for now. And as a minority, a religious minority, the, country, the government cannot do that because this will contradict separation between church and state. So religious communities like ours have to take care of their own selves and have the, to do, uh, have to count their, uh, their numbers and uh, uh, represent themselves. The second, the second uh, signature project is unity convention. 
every four years, the national organizations will combine together and do a national unifying convention, and that will be the year of the presidential elections. Imagine of presidential ele uh, candidates will start now to court the Muslim community votes because we show in numbers and in big educated numbers in Washington, D.C. The third and last project, before I get to my subject, is a national lobbying day. Just last week, people were talking about Netanyahu's uh, speech to the Congress and the fact that APAC was able to bring 16,000 activists to lobby members of Congress. I believe the Muslim community can do this and more. Can do this and more on domestic and international issues. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Yeah, we're getting there. So, on an annual basis, we will have a national day of lobbying the Congress. But this will be the result of lobbying work in our districts nationwide. And that's why I'm proud to tell you that CARE is working with other organizations to do uh, Muslim youth summits on a regular basis and take hundreds of young people to uh, lobby their senators, state senators, delegates, uh, mayors, and so on, on important issues for them locally and nationally. Now, the issue of this incident that took place. To me, one case is many cases. One person that we lose is many, is many. So we care about young people who go astray. But also putting things in, things in perspective is very, very important. I believe there's a lot of hype and a lot of media attention to this issue and a lot of politics involved in it. And I would like you to pay attention to this. Three people from our community got killed. Do you remember that in Chapel Hill? A few weeks ago, at the beginning, no media attention. No politician made statements. Why? Because the victims are Muslim and the killer was not Muslim. And they built it as a parking dispute. Total nonsense. I drove there with a team of lawyers to meet with the families and the communities and we hear different stories. Of course, we do not have a proof that it was a hit crime, but we cannot underestimate the lack of attention to what's taking place to our communities. Within the past five weeks, almost 10 Muslims were killed. And many people point to Islamophobia and fear mongering. I do not have evidence to show that these crimes that took place are linked to Islamophobia directly. But no one can argue with me that the climate of fear against the Muslim community contributes to hate mongering and violence against the Muslim community. No one can argue with me on that because our offices and our national office, we deal with this case, these cases every day. Vandalism, hate crimes, and discrimination, and lack of attention from our national media. So there is a disproportionate media attention to crimes that come from the Muslim community versus crimes against the Muslim community versus crimes from people who are not Muslim, who kill people left and right, and we don't see their religion, their churches, their synagogues are implicated on national television and special reporting and live reporting. We believe that disproportionate media attention is politicized and we need to speak out. We need to call out the media and we need to call the hypocrisy of some politicians. So your involvement is very, very important, brothers and sisters. Part of the extremism that some young people have exhibited over, over the years, the past few years, and I believe that it is a minute issue it is a minute, minute issue, which means it's not really uh, you know, uh, widespread, maybe like it's in, in Europe. The United States Muslim community is a proud American Muslim community. We reject extremism because we know our faith is a faith of moderation. We believe that if we have issues with our government, we go and speak to our government. And let me just share with you this story. And I, of course, I cannot tell you not to be distracted. Uh, some people point out to Congressman Jerry Connolly that he took a courageous stance when he questioned a government representative in their support to the coup in Egypt. 
and Congressman Jerry Connolly was just grinning this individual that his video became viral on the internet. People are so proud of this congressman that he has this courage to question the support for the Egyptian coup against democracy. And people were very excited, but they did not know what led Jerry Connolly to take this position. Because a month before, myself and other people from the community, especially donors, we paid a visit to Jerry Connolly in his office. And we told him that you have to speak out against the coup in Egypt. You have to speak against the massacre of over 1,000 people in Rabah Square. And he was arguing with us. But we were trying to give him information and we gave him documentation. We did not know what kind of impression we really left on him. And he pointed out that one of his staff is an Egyptian cop and he got a lot of information from them. And we said, that's a very legitimate point of view, we need to hear from them. But what's taking place in Egypt then was a coup against democracy, against the will of the people. And something needs to be said. We fund the Egyptian government. We supply them with arms, we train them. We need to speak out against that. And eventually, Jerry Connolly took that position because he knew that representatives of the community are concerned about this. We represent thousands of Muslims in the Northern Virginia community. So the reason I share this story with you is, my point is, your voice count. When you speak to your public officials, elected officials, they listen to you and they have to take your concerns seriously. And that's why I believe why some young Muslims go to the internet because our mosques are close to discussion. Our imams and leaders, not of course the imams here, uh, they don't talk about domestic and foreign policy. That's why young people go to the internet and they become easy targets for ISIS to be recruited. So then we have to speak about these issues in our khutbas in our durus, in our halakas, and we have to have an open discussion. But most importantly, how constructive can we? We cannot just complain. What can we offer in terms of solution? We have to educate our, uh, ourselves, and we have to speak, and we have to organize. Then our elected officials will take us seriously, and they know that we are engaged, and we engage them intelligently. This is very important. I'm not talking about foreign policy. I'm talking about everything that concerns us in these neighborhoods. The traffic, the environment, safety in our schools, unemployment. All of these issues are important issues. We don't only talk about them unless they affect us directly. That is not the concept of mercy in Islam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ why we have not sent you except as a mercy to mankind. That's how the Prophet ﷺ was defined. We care about people. We reach out to people. And we take care of their business. And we help them. We don't only talk about things unless they affect us. This is hypocrisy. This is lack of care. And that's why, sisters and brothers, when we are involved in the public affairs of our communities, our voices are recognized. They're loud, and we help making decisions, good decisions that affect us and affect other people on the domestic level and foreign level. Now, to wind up, ISIS. I believe ISIS is a limited recent phenomenon that because it was not taken care of in the beginning, it mushroomed and went out of control. And I'll give you an example. A few years ago, Brother Rafi, myself, and other community members held a press conference. But before the press conference was held, parents of five young people in Virginia contacted Brother Naim Beg, the president of ICNA, who contacted me, and he brought the five parents to meet with me in the office. And he, they told us, the five parents, that the five young people are missing. They told them that they were at a party, like, you know, in the D.C. Bulletin area, and all of a sudden, 24 hours passed, nobody showed up. 
And that's the, 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 the worst nightmare a parent can have, right? When five young people are missing. Where are they? Nobody knows. Have you seen any symptoms on them? Like, you know, were they angry about something? They said, no, they're good kids. One of them is valedictorian. First in his class in dentist, dentist school in Washington, D.C. Successful young people. Where are they? What they said, they disappeared. But they left the USB flash drive behind them. I said, give it to me. I took it, put it in the laptop, and I saw a 10-minute farewell speech saying to their parents goodbye. But in the video, and that's the, the problem, in the video, they talked about Afghanistan. Muslims being killed in Afghanistan. The invasion of Afghanistan. They talk about the Iraqi invasion. The US invaded Iraq based on lies. They talk about the oppression of the Palestinian people for 55 years. Nothing is being done about it. These are legitimate issues. And they said, we cannot stand it anymore. Nothing is being done. We have to do something. Also, they talked about drone attacks. Drones that kill so many innocent people. And Basically, they concluded in the video saying, we have to do what we have to do, and they disappeared. What did we do? We contacted the government immediately. We told the parents that the best thing is to do is to contact the FBI, is to contact the government, to save their lives and the lives of other people. They were arrested, and they have been convicted. Why did this happen? We, I, I asked the parents myself, do you talk about politics at home? Said, Nothing. Do you discuss issues? Nothing. These people are angry. Some of them are misguided, or maybe all of them are misguided. When they don't see us tackling these important issues, when they don't see us taking, making progress, where do they go? They go to the cyberspace. They see ISIS videos. ISIS is claiming to represent the Muslims now in, in the fight against oppression. They are misled and they are misleading people. They are preying on legitimate concerns. They have hijacked these legitimate concerns. They consider the majority of Muslims are more dead. Even the majority of Muslims in their eyes are more dead. You know what more dead means, right? Apostate, non-Muslim. And they kill Muslims, they kill minorities. They have no mercy. And they hold the banner of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I gave khutbah in this question and in many messages about the extremism of ISIS and the un-Islamic behavior of ISIS. But also the lack of leadership in dealing with issues on the ground that ISIS is exploiting. In September, we published a 24-page letter signed by grand muftis and major scholars around the world, denouncing ISIS and dismantling their so-called Islamic argument and refuting their claim that what they're doing is they're doing it in the name of Islam. I urge everyone to read that letter. It's in Arabic, but also there's translation. We refute theologically that what they're doing is a deviation to the deviation from Islam. And what they're doing is a big disservice to Muslims. In fact, Islamophobes in this country and around the world, they use it to attack Islam as a religion, and they use it to attack the Muslim community. So why do young Muslims, very few, join ISIS? From the United States, 100 people. 100 people is a significant number, but it is a significant phenomenon to me. So I do not allow the media to say that this is a huge phenomenon, it's all over the place. This is a misguided analysis, and it is politically designed to spread fear and suspicion about young Muslims in the country. How to deal with it? We urge young people to speak up, to come and speak to the imam, to the parents, and talk about how they feel about issues. 
but also we would like them to be involved, to speak to their members of government about their issues. And we should show, we should show progress in these issues. Secondly, we should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we fear anybody. That we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that taking any violent actions against innocent people through twisted interpretation of Islam, you can deceive some people but you cannot deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why many people who join ISIS, they discover that this ISIS enterprise is a criminal enterprise and when they want to flip ISIS, they execute them. They execute them. Even when they discover that ISIS is just a fraud, criminal enterprise, and they decide that this is horrible, we cannot be there, they cannot leave the camps, they execute them. Within ISIS there is a division now. Because people start to see that this is a criminal mindset, criminal enterprise, and it's not it's doing nothing but harm to the Muslim communities. So to conclude, we have to welcome our young people to speak up if they have any issue. We are an open book community, and our government should be able to address these issues openly, because just talking about violent extremism without putting things in context is, is being dishonest. We have to show that our government has a correct foreign policy, that they are doing their best to have peace in the region, and they support the moderate people, so that we don't see another ISIS five years from now. Otherwise, ISIS will emerge. If ISIS dies and disappears, there will be another form of ISIS. There will be another form of ISIS. Different name, different circumstances, maybe different geography. But we as American Muslims, we have to use all our civic resources and access to our government, to our media, to be part of the conversation and our position and Islam's position on extremism cannot be doubted. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, Brother Nihat. Uh, next, our guest is uh, Brother Haris Karim. Uh, like care protects our rights if we're in trouble. We call CARE uh, to represent us. Brother Haris is the director of MPAC. They work with our government to change policy. They work on policy issues. And alhamdulillah, they do a wonderful job representing us. You heard that there were Muslim leaders who were at the White House uh, discussing uh, extremism uh, with our president. And Brother Haris was one of those Muslim leaders who represented us. Please welcome Brother Haris. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, we need some apple juice up in here. Assalamu uh, alaikum, everyone. Need some sugar to get your blood flowing. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious and most merciful. I want to start off by asking every single one of you a quick question. How many of you believe that there is okay. How many of you believe that there is severe injustice that is taking place in this world? The rest, how many of you do not believe that there's injustice that takes place in this world? I think there's a consensus that the world we live in is a place that is full of injustice. Injustice will never leave the face of the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says in the Quran that we've created this world with sunan, with a pattern. It's a pattern that he's created this world with. We have the rich, we have poor. We have justice, we have injustice. We have the powerful and we have the weak. 
That is part of how God created the world. And as believers, He tells us that our role in this world is to try to bridge that gap between injustice and justice, between the rich and between the poor, between the powerful and between the powerless. Every day, the role of the believer, as he says, Kuntum khayra ummatin, you are the best of nations that are set forth for mankind, ta'muruna bil ma'ruf, that you enjoin what is good so that you work towards bringing justice, wa tanhawna an al and that you forbid from evil action so that you minimize justice. Upholding justice, minimizing injustice. That is the role of believers. So we can agree that no matter where you live, which era you live in, which time you live in, which country you live in, which nation you live in, injustice is a phenomenon that will always exist. And the Prophet who was the best of all people, the best of all mankind, when God sent him with a message, he faced injustice and severe injustice to an extent where people around him were killed, people around him were tortured, people around him felt injustice in the most severe manner. Intense injustice. Just as you see around you in the world today, children dying, nations being destroyed, people being impacted by injustice. That was in a microcosm how the Prophet, peace be upon him, lived his life at a certain point. But you know what? There was a reason why he lived that. Because God wanted to teach us how to deal with injustice. Grievances, injustice will always exist. And Brother Nihad mentioned how you deal with grievances and injustice. As an American Muslim, you deal with it through civic engagement, you deal with it through engaging and trying to change policy. That's one way to deal with it. But there's a mindset. There's a mindset that ISIS and groups like it is putting out that contradicts the inherent understanding of believers on how to deal with injustice. ISIS is not new. ISIS is not a recent phenomenon. There's been formations of ISIS throughout history. Extreme groups are a part of, unfortunately, of human beings. The Prophet, peace be upon him, warned us about extremism. He said, be careful, be warned about extremism. It destroys nations. Extremism destroys nations. Whatever that form of extremism might be. So extremism is not new. Grievances is not new. And ISIS is an iteration. Before ISIS, you had Al-Qaeda. Before Al-Qaeda, you guys probably, a lot of the young people were too young to know before Al-Qaeda. You had Jihad al-Islami in Egypt. Before that, you had other groups in, in North Africa. And you had groups in, 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 in Pakistan, Afghanistan region. In the modern times, extremism is not new. It's been formations of its different type of extremism when grievances arise in different parts of the world and we don't deal with those grievances properly. But what's dangerous to a lot of us and a lot of our young people is they recognize injustice. And as I mentioned last week in the khutbah here at Darnur, every young person should recognize injustice. And they should feel injustice in this world. That is the role of believers. If a young person recognizes grievances and speaks out about, about grievances, they're doing their job as a young person who, is, who wants to see a better world, 
who wants to see a world around them that is not business as usual. That is the beauty of being young. The beauty of being young is that you want to change the world. You want to make the world a better place. And you take risks that a lot of older people won't take. Isn't that true? As a young person, you have the willingness to take risks that a lot of older people won't do. And so ISIS preys on that emotion and that feeling. Because their narrative about injustice is a very toxic narrative. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, dealt with injustice, he dealt with it to understand that beyond just solving the problem, we have to be the moral conscience of society. So, when he went, remember when he went to Taif? Who knows the story of the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he went to the city of Taif? A lot of people don't. So he went to the city of Taif because he was being persecuted, tortured, his people were being killed in Mecca. He went to Taif to find refuge in that city. When he went there, you know what they did to him? They stoned him out of the city to an extent where his body was bleeding. So he went outside of the city, he exited the city, sat down to get some rest before he went back to Mecca. And you know what happened? It's a fascinating story. A fascinating story. These people who just dealt with him with extreme injustice. The angel came to him and said, God has given me permission, Allah has given me permission to destroy this town. Because they wanted, I mean, this is happening because we are the audience. We are the consumers of the story. God is teaching us a lesson. So listen to this. He said, God has allowed me to destroy the people of this town because of what they did to you. The grievances, the injustice that they did to you. You know what? They deserve being destroyed. And God has given me the permission. You give me the, you give me the word and I will crush them in between these two mountains. These two mountains, I will crush these two mountains on top of this city. You know what the response of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was to injustice and to grievance? He understood a bigger picture. Yeah, he could have been justified because God allowed it. He would have been justified to take revenge, to kill. He would have been justified at that point. But he said, no. These are people who don't know maybe there will come a generation from them that will see God's guidance and light. And what happened? There was a generation that came from them that saw that guidance and that light. But he taught us also that when you deal with injustice, it's about solving the problem immediately, but it's also about being the moral conscience of the world. If the Muslim community wants to be the moral conscience of America, of the world, of any place that we go to, or that we are part of, or that we live in, people need to see us as the moral conscience. People need to see our behavior and our actions. Winning hearts and minds of people is critical. Because we need to help them understand not only the injustice that exists in the world, but that we represent a divine faith and a faith of mercy and justice. That is key in how we address any injustice. But ISIS, an extremist narrative of the world, is a very, very different narrative. Their narrative is not a divinely inspired narrative. Their narrative is what the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself warned us against. And that is what's key for us as for you, not us, I'm no longer a young person. For you as young people to understand that the ISIS narrative is toxic, it's simple, it doesn't see the world for what it is, but it can be appealing sometimes. It's appealing because they put their message out in very sophisticated designs and they make it simple. They say it's the, wor it's, it's the world against Islam. 
world is not that simple. The world is a complicated place where there is injustice, where there's mercy, where there's solutions, where there's a way of addressing issues. And we've seen it. We've seen those issues be solved. You saw the people of Bosnia, the injustice that they went through. But you saw leadership and how they changed that. You saw someone like Nelson Mandela in South Africa. In modern times, this is not old days, the injustice of, of apartheid in South Africa and how they were able to change that. So injustice will always exist. But as believers, it is our role to minimize the injustice and maximize justice. But we do it in a way where we remain the moral conscience of the world, where we don't buy into the simple narrative that is put out, and we understand that grievance must be addressed, but grievance is not justification for barbarism, for killing, for mayhem, because of it. And I'll just close with this. You know who the primary victims of extremism and terrorism is? There's actually a study. There's a study done, a worldwide study, by multiple think tanks. You know who the primary victims of terrorism are? ISIS claims to kill Americans and the West for invading or for killing or for doing whatever. But you know who the primary victim of terrorism? Since 1964, when they started keeping count of the study, you know who the primary victims are? Who can say? Go ahead, say it. Muslims. Over 89% of the victims of terrorism have been Muslims. So who are they killing? You're killing the actual victim who's being victimized? How does that make sense? The slogan of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and Jihad al-Islami and all these groups prior to that have been what? We're defending Islam by killing Muslims, by slaughtering Muslims. That's not, that in no way represents our faith. And so I encourage you to engage on this issue. There's, there is the policy issue, but then there's a reality that you live on a daily basis because you feel injustice. So when you see this online, when you see this in the public, engage it. Don't back away from it. Because backing away from it only allows those who are extremists in this country to deal with it. If Muslims are not the ones dealing with this issue of violent extremism, you know who will be dealing with it? The Islamophobes, the people who don't like Muslims. That's what we've seen, what we've seen over the past 15 years. When Muslims are not there dealing with this issue, they're not the experts, they're not the ones around the table, they're not the one in the room to push back against government. You know who is? The Islamophobes. The Islamophobes are the ones who write the papers, who give the models, who do the framework, Islamophobes are the ones who do that. And if we pull back, and we don't engage in this conversation, we're leaving the field open for those who actually have an agenda against us. Thank you so much. Salam. Brother Rafi asked me to uh, mention something. Uh, as he mentioned, I work for the Muslim Public Affairs Council, uh, MPAC, and we work on a lot of these issues. But actually, next week will be my last week at the Muslim Public Affairs Council that I have. Um, I will be leaving. I will, as, and I, as I finished with what I mentioned, I'll be joining the government. And I will be working on national security policy. So some of these issues, some of these issues that are impacting our community, um, I'll be a senior policy advisor to the Secretary of Homeland Security, dealing with a lot of these national security policies. Um, because as I said at the end, if we're not at the table, we're not the one helping to write the papers, to make the decisions, to push back. There are other people who are there. And those people have a very specific view and agenda against our community. So as Brother had mentioned earlier, it's important for us to get involved in the system. It's important for us to be the experts and the people pushing back because that's the way we're actually going to change those grievances and those injustices around us. Thank you, so much. Thank you, Brother Hadith. 
and we thank you for your service. Uh, these two brothers here, they have been representing our community uh, for many years. Uh, and I'd like to thank both of them uh, for being diligent uh, and working day and night uh, at different levels uh, and protecting our rights and representing our community. Um, earlier when I was opening up, I did mention that this was the first program, a uh, series of programs that we are planning to do, uh, and they're going to be done regionally as well. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite uh, Brother Sayed Mokhadir, the president of Adam Center, uh, to, to come and explain to us uh, some of the programs that we're working on right now. My brothers and sisters, the points that have been highlighted today. For our time, this is probably one of the most critical challenges, and I use the word challenges, that Muslim community are facing. And the reason I use the word challenges is because every challenge, if it is addressed right, it can be an opportunity as well. Therefore, it is a greatest challenge for us that must be dealt with the right measures which can be transformed into an opportunity for Muslim communities here in the U.S. and around the world. And the reason I say that, today if you look at what is happening, and our speakers previously highlighted the magnitude of the brutality that's uh, happening, and yes, majority of the victims are Muslims. On the other side, also our speakers mentioned earlier, where we live, many of our Muslims feel we're also victim in the land where we live because of the injustices. Some of us live it that way, at least. At the root of all of that is, of course, injustice. But what is the solution, however? That is the key question. We can all give many hypotheses that this is the solution. But at the end of the day, as a collective community, we must look into the problem at its core and come up with the measure that collectively, what is the solution? What shall we do on an individual level? As an individual Muslim, what should I do? Whether I'm a parent, I'm a, I'm a youth, I'm a child, I'm a teenager, whatever level I'm in. I'm a teacher, I'm an imam. Whatever role I'm playing in our community, each one of our costs is to come together collectively and to come up with a solution that serves to address this the greatest cost. So to my brothers and sisters, with that in mind, Alhamdulillah, the community here are thinking, um, this is the beginning, what we're doing here is reactionary. The question is how can we become at this point proactive? The first step is our Imams, all of our Imams, is to collectively come together and have a, a clear understanding of the magnitude of the problem. This is the first step. In their khutbas, our this is, although it's a youth uh, uh, problem that we're highlighting, at its core, it may not necessarily be a youth problem. It could be a family problem first before it becomes a youth problem. As some of the speakers earlier mentioned, that we are not speaking things that we should be speaking at our home. Therefore, some of the youth are feeling isolated and not connected with the community at large. Therefore, they are thinking along that line. But still, what I'm saying is a hypothesis. 
what we need to do actually, we all here and people like ourselves need to come together collectively, have focus group and have an understanding of the problem. Our imam needs to get together, have a clear understanding of the problem is, and then they need to unite on a message that this is what our stance should be against ISIS. No matter what ideological differences are on the stance of extremism, this is where we collect this stand. And that has to happen at local level first, and then it, 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 it needs to replicate across the country. But in this area, inshallah, in the DMV area, we are thinking of having a large conference as such. The idea of the conference, and before the conference, we'll have several meetings of the imams, of the families, of the youths, to sort of formulate the hypothesis. What are the issues that we see? Sort of a root cause analysis for a community. What is the root causes that drives us to this? What is the root causes that all of a sudden we find a youth from, from Woodbridge joining ISIS? At this study, I, I saw the event, by the way, there are others in this area as well, that they have been dissuaded to go away from that, to go join ISIS. So this is not an isolated event, but then again, extremism itself is not a new phenomenon either. It is not, it should not be a surprise to us that one or two are joining, because this is not a new phenomenon. But we, as a community, collectively need to come together and formulate a right solution, united right solution, and work for it. Anyways, therefore, my brother and sister, the first step would be in that, that we were working on, Brother Rafi, inshallah, is, a, is part of the team, is formulate what should be the solution. But that solution has to have everybody's input, not just if a group of people sat down and thought, this is the solution, let's work together. Everybody has to be collectively part of it. Whether you are a, a, a very practicing Muslim, or you are a moderately practicing Muslim, or you're seldom practicing Muslim, you, everyone has a role in this. As you could see, those who are joining ISIS, they don't fit in any of this category. They could be the seldomly practicing families, but joining ISIS because this is how they found uh, the synergy there. But also best practicing, uh, also were there, right, from, uh, the families from Chicago. So now, the solution cannot be we just focus on one group and formulate a solution. We have to understand the dynamics of the family, what has caused this situation. Therefore, my brother and sister, inshallah, the idea is we will have our imams collectively in this area sit down, ideologically understand the magnitude and our stance as a collective ummah, that what should be the message, and they should deliver that. Our youth directors need to come together, and I'll come to I'll also uh, come to understanding. This is our approach should be with our youth. Our masjid leaders need to come together, and say so this is how our approach should be as we deal with this situation. Likewise, our families need to have some work out from this. That this is what we should be doing. Our uh, Sunday school, Saturday school. I mean, this is where we start. He said, but you present Islam at an early stage, not necessarily through the internet. But also, most importantly, and some of the speakers earlier mentioned, the communication aspect of it. With one magazine, with ma one magazine for Dabit, right? Dabit. One magazine. They're sort of making Yasir Qadi uh, Murtad, uh, Hamza Yusuf Murtad, and they're justifying it. In their magazine, this is their recruiting tool online, and this is how they're dump, uh, dumping on our youth. These are the reasoning behind it. They're slaughtering the people, this is the, this is the reason they are behind it. Unfortunately, we as Muslims, as the local Muslims here, haven't addressed these issues yet. We have not gone at that viral level and said, okay, your magazine is saying this, this is absolutely uh, against Islam. We're saying it on our level, but to address them at the same, same magnitude, at the same level, Today, I think, or yesterday, somebody said about 90,000 messages they sent a day. 90,000 messages that go out. My brothers and sisters, we collectively need to come together to replicate that. And a lot more messages. We could do that, but we all need to come together. This is our message. We have to identify, clearly formulate our message, and then work together collectively. At your home, at your kitchen, everywhere you send out, you address them. And that's the only way we can, inshallah, come like that. So that starts, as I say. First, here, at your local level, from your home. Not necessarily even at your restaurant. From your home, this is where, this is where those, those people who are joining do us in. So this is exactly where we need to start. And inshallah, we'll at the conference, we would like to invite all of you, we'll set you the date. Before we get to the conference, we'll have a set of scholars who work with the imams, inshallah, to formulate the message.
So this is this is the invite for you. We need every one of you to think this is a beginning, and don't even think this is the end. This is the beginning where we inshallah go. It's a long journey. We'll go together, but inshallah we'll come back the right way and make it. As I say, to every challenge is an opportunity. We'll turn it into an opportunity for Muslims in America and in the West. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Our next speaker, uh, he represents Make, uh, make Space. Uh, he's a very familiar face here in Baton Rouge and Northern Virginia. I'd uh, like to invite Imam Zia.
in short, to talk about the reality that the Palestinians, for example, that hurts us the most, right? That the issue of the injustice and that the Palestinians have been subjected to for decades, that hurts us and that causes us the greatest amount of pain. Yet, the Palestinians at the highest level are talking to the Israelis, they're talking to the international community. So there is a peace process, which is, you know, we don't, we're not very optimistic about it, but it's there. And a lot of other things like that that are happening that prove to us that there is a lot of nuance, that there is a lot we can do uh, in, 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 in place of getting involved in, in violence, you know, if there were a group that were fighting the oppressors of this world and engaging them on, on the battlefield nobly, maybe it would be okay with our youth joining them and fighting the oppressors. But where is that? Is it even possible in our, in, in our world today for that kind of a group to exist? With the kind of weapons that we own, the kind of weapons that the modern world has, is it even possible to fight nobly? and to only target those who are oppressing you, and to only target military targets. Is it even possible? And what are the options you have? You have the Taliban in Afghanistan. And I have lived through that reign of terror in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. And I saw, uh, you know, firsthand, my firsthand experience is the kind of brutality that they brought upon their own people. Remember when the Taliban appeared on the scene? It was 1993-94. Not a single foreign soldier on the soil of Afghanistan. No NATO, no ISAF, no Americans there, nobody. Who are they killing? Their own people, Muslims, that didn't agree with them. Like you see today, ISIS is doing, killing Shias, killing Sunnis that don't agree with them, killing Everyone and anyone, they, they call us the Fati, who you would think ideologically will be closest to them, they call him a Murta. So who is then left a Muslim in their eyes? Those are the kinds of groups and options we have when it comes to violent resistance. And I'm not here to declare violent resistance as unlawful or to abrogate that. But what I'm discussing is the reality of our world is such that perhaps we should be focusing more on non-violent means and encouraging that to be a response to injustices that are going on. And we have an example, a model for that in the seer of the Prophet The entire life of the Prophet the Meccan period, is non-violent resistance. And it is as if that whole part of the Prophet Sallallahu life, that whole period has been completely discarded and the only thing that folks uh, have around the world to counter violence and to counter injustice is to be part of the violent group. And so that, that's one thought I wanted to share. The other thought is for us to, uh, to understand that we have a sphere of concern, that we have a lot of things that we're worried about here and around the world. But we should act where we are most effective. And that's our sphere of influence. What is your sphere of influence at the high school or college? Day? Your immediate surroundings, your house, your parents, your friends, your MSA, that's where you can be most effective and do something valuable and worthwhile for Islam for humanity, for, for this country that you live in. And so, uh, the, the sphere of influence versus the sphere of concern is something that we need to distinguish. Because when a kid flies to Turkey and then on to Syria to join ISIS, what they're doing is they are leaving behind their sphere of influence and joining their sphere of concern where they are just completely uh, obliterated. They go there and what becomes of them? A lot of them, I'm sure, they're, they're dying to leave and they're probably leaving as we speak and, and getting killed for it, many of them. But that's the kind of uh, thing happens when you leave your sphere of influence 
where you can be most effective and do so much good and uh, go after your uh, sphere of influence. And lastly, we need to discuss and address our own uh, issues and, and the decadence within the, the Ummah. Within the Ummah, there's injustice, Muslim on Muslim injustice and violence. And what's going on is, as I gave you the example of the Taliban, when they came, there were no soldiers of, of uh, foreign countries there. When the Soviets left in 1989, I vividly remember that that was our victory as the Afghan nation against the Soviet Empire. We were celebrating, we were very happy, and we were all saying the utopia is here. The Mujahideen have gone, the Soviets have been defeated, we have our, our country is free now. Guess what happened? Muslim on Muslim violence. We turned on one another because there is internal issues that we haven't addressed. There is decadence within this ummah, decadence within our own communities that we need to address. Before we uh, jump on to these bigger issues of solving the problems of the world, we solve Syria or Iraq or Palestine or Afghanistan, let us solve our own issues internally. Our own issues with one another and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, if we can focus on that and we model uh, good citizens of our own communities, the bigger issue will take care of themselves, inshallah. There are ups and downs. We cannot take law into a, 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 the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into our own hands. And that's exactly what ISIS is trying to do, to change uh, the map of the world by mainly killing their own Muslim brothers and sisters. And, and that's no way to, to succeed and no way to, uh, to help uh, the Muslim world as, as, as everyone before me. They, they, it is very abundantly clear that the, the victims of these folks is mainly Muslim. The victims of al and Taliban and ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, all of them, the largest number of people they killed, perhaps 99% of people they, they injured and killed and, and, and harmed, in addition to the image of Islam, is Muslim. It's Muslim. But there's no khayr in that, there's no good in that, and that needs to be emphasized that while this world is, is not a fair world, that there is so much injustice, that we have a lot of grievances. ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Taliban and so forth and Boko Haram, they are simply not the solution. They are far worse than the, the situation that we have uh, in the world around us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the prophet to work on these issues within our own families and communities so that we bring and build a firewall in our community because we cannot bank on ISIS not being there for our kids not to be recruited. Because as uh, Haris and, and others mentioned, there will be ISIS, there will be uh, another ISIS when ISIS is gone, as there were previously more groups will emerge on the scene because of what's going on in this world. So we cannot just bank on that for us not to be, for our youth to, not to be recruited. What we need to do is build a firewall within our own communities by engaging our youth, by engaging our own government, by engaging locally and, and uh, domestically on issues that are uh, of importance to, to us as Americans, and not just international issues, not just foreign, uh, foreign policy, so that we, we have a holistic, nuanced understanding of power, a holistic, nuanced understanding of what's going on around the world, so that we will not be affected by uh, recruitment videos and uh, David and uh, Inspire and so on and so forth. And I say that because those things by themselves alone cannot be affected. If the kid joins ISIS, it's not just because they watch video. There's also uh, theological and political discourse that they get at home as well. In our living room, when we discuss these grievances, as I said at the beginning, we're not discussing them properly, so they get some kind of half-hearted attempt at addressing those grievances as well, and so and then they get a little more from ISIS or whoever, and then they are recruited, then they're, they're radicalized. But if the foundations are strong at the local level, at the family level, at the masjid level, I don't think recruitment videos will, will be able to 
uh, successfully or prove anyone in Shahada. So that's what we need to do at our community level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to do that for our friends. Thank you, Imam Zaya. Uh, we're going to allow a five minute break. Those of you who want to get up and grab uh, something to drink. Uh, and inshallah, we will, before we go to the uh, question and answer session, inshallah, uh, we're going to close with a bang. Uh, we have Imam Suleiman Jello, that uh, most of our community, mashallah, uh, love to hear from him. So if you'd like to get up and grab something to drink, please do so. And return as soon as possible because we will start right away. <laughs>